thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so if I s uh, seem slightly uninterested, that's because I feel I'm feeling slightly sick. So uh, uh, please bear with me, but uh, everything will be all right. If I fall, Melvin will probably catch me, or uh, please call an ambulance. Uh, so uh, our presentation is not uh, really about, it's not that bad, but it's not really about uh, visualizing the past, but actually about using visual sources to study the past. So in the next 20 minutes, we will first give you some uh, background uh, on our research question. Um, <laughs> then we will discuss the main research questions. So what, does, uh, what role does color play in imagining different kinds of worlds? And we will specifically focus on two uh, kinds of worlds, which are, of course, uh, directly connected to each other, so the Orient and the Occident. Then we will go into our approach, so the data we collected uh, and the methods we apply. And finally, we will present some uh, results and also share some points for uh, discussion. <laughs> so uh, the background uh, of this research is basically uh, long-standing questions of what colors uh, humans actually see. It's a long-standing question. People have been interested for, in that question for centuries, right? Think, for example, of uh, Goethe, who was already interested in this. Uh, but basically what it has become, this question, is how do uh, people, uh, humans, actually divide the color space, so all the colors we can possibly see, into distinct color terms. So the colors we use to describe and understand our world on a daily basis. <coughs> and there basically have been two sort of main uh, schools in answering this question. So we have the universalist approach, uh, which is uh, mostly represented by the work of Berlin and Kay, already from 1969, who says that they have a sort of a universalist and evolutionary approach. So they say like color terms are related to the total number of color terms that a society, a language, a culture have. Uh, so these are always limited. And uh, if a society develops, so it becomes more complex, then color terms are uh, added in a predictable uh, order, and that's what they uh, uh, proved, or that's what they said, at least. Then we also have the relativist uh, school, uh, which is mainly represented by the Italian semiotician Umberto Eco, uh, who sort of posited uh, that the, this ontological structure, so the mapping of the color space into distinct color terms, depends very much on the usefulness uh, of uh, color terms or, or of this system in uh, everyday life. Uh, and you have famous examples about uh, many words for snow or many words for cattle, for example, right? <coughs> so uh, Melvin and I thought that these universalist and cultural relative view share a very common characteristic, namely that both theories uh, relate the colors that we see to a very single and closed off uh, culture. And for us as historians, as, and as for me as a media historian, this runs into two uh, problems, right? So we first have a very big historical question, that of globalization, right? So different colors and uh, different cultures and their color system have come into very heavy contact with each other over the last uh, couple of centuries. Uh, and secondly, color has also become uh, mediatized in the last uh, two centuries, I would say. So <laughs> different uh, media, such as painting or photography, uh, limit the color space, so the, the colors we can possibly see, uh, differently, right? So they produce, in a sense, distinct historical uh, palettes. So the colors we can uh, see and then map into distinct uh, color terms. Right. So what we, hope, uh, what we hope to do is that by examining and comparing different historical media or color media, we can sort of approximate the part of the color space that people in the past uh, were exposed to. And by doing this, <laughs> uh, we can also study how these different uh, media palettes so the colors that were enabled by different media were used to represent or imagine uh, different worlds. And we specifically focus on this uh, dual worlds, the Orient and the Occident. So that the Oriental world probably ring a bell for many of you, right? So this is directly connected to the word of uh, Edward Said. So Edward Said uh, posited that the West uh, has defined itself by con contrasting itself uh, with the, what he calls the imagined geography uh, of the Orient, right? And in a very sort of uh, 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 simplified version, the West is uh, seen or imagined as, progress, uh, as a world of progress, industrialized and rational, and the Orient is seen as, it, uh, as a mirrored image, so as static, underdeveloped, and emotional. Um, positively, for some painters and uh, uh, writers, right, uh, the Orient is also seen as a mysterious and a sort of a sensual world, right? So a world full of sort of strange customs, a uh, different smell, and also, very important for our research, uh, very intense uh, colors. So uh, Edward Said mainly or uh, exclusively uh, focused on text, uh, but since uh, he wrote his book, many uh, have extended his work to also include visual uh, culture. So 
Uh, this is visual orientalism. Think, for example, of uh, famous French painters such as uh, Eugène Delacroix, or in fact, the guy you can see here uh, on the slide, uh, Jerome, right, who made many orientalist uh, paintings. Um, does that stop? Is orientalist visual culture uh, contained to visual to uh, painting? Well, no, many have argued. We also have orientalist photography. Uh, and uh, this sort of, um, uh, uh, the, the switch from painting uh, to photography resulted in two things, namely that uh, the sort of the mass access, uh, the, the photography provided mass access to orientalist visual culture. And because uh, um, photography was, was seen as a more objective medium, uh, the, the sort of uh, visual fantasisms, as uh, Beidat calls it, right, of the Orient of Orientalism were also seen as more objective. So most of these studies on visual Orientalism focus very much on content, so the things we see on the images, right? Uh, but uh, as Benjamin argued, not the famous Benjamin, but another Benjamin in 2003, um, <laughs> Orientalism also finds expression in a, a specific uh, Orientalist aesthetic. And one of the key, as he calls it, aesthetic challenges of this Orientalist uh, uh, visual culture is capturing uh, the uh, color of the Orient. Right, so we now come to our actually research. So we have three uh, research question, questions. Uh, do specific media affect the use of color? Can we differentiate between the Orient and the Occident across different color media? And does the presence or absence of specific colors define visual Orientalism? And we want to uh, apply, uh, approach this uh, these questions computationally, right? So we have two uh, uh, data sets of different media. So we have a set of around uh, uh, 65,000 uh, photochromes, which we collected from the National Library of Co uh, Congress, and a set of uh, around, uh, sorry, a set of uh, 6,500 photochromes and a set of 65,000 uh, autochromes, which we collected from the Albert Kahn Museum uh, in uh, France. Right, so what is the difference between this, uh, these two media? Right, so photochrome was a process which was patented in the 1880s by the Swiss company uh, Photoglob, and it basically involved uh, the hand coloring of a black and white negative, right? And on the basis of this black and white or this colored black and white negative, uh, a printer would produce several lithographic tin stones by letting uh, light pass through these uh, negative. And then in the end, this would lead to uh, uh, pictures, as you can see here from the city of Graz, right? that sort of contain between four to 14 different colors and uh, mixtures of them. So the, despite claims that the photography that the of the company that photochromes represented uh, photo photography in the colors of uh, nature, photochromes are in fact colored in photographs, right? So they are colored in by a human. Uh, so they represent the color sense of the printer within, of course, the affordances uh, of the medium of photochrome. So the autochrome uh, process uh, was invented or patented by the French um, Lumiere brothers in 1903. And in this process, color is actually uh, captured, right? So it is derived from the uh, photomechanical process. So this process entails that we have a glass plate which is coated with uh, microscopically small uh, grains of red, orange, uh, green, and blue violet uh, potato starch. And the colors we see on a photochrome, as you can see here on the slide, uh, are produced uh, if the light comes through these, um, uh, through these different potato starch uh, grains, then the, our eye, our human eye, blends them together into um, very uh, many different uh, colors, a little bit like uh, pointillist uh, paintings uh, would do, right? It's also based on the same principle, actually. So <laughs> this process was very much or quickly embraced by all sorts of Orientalist photographers who were very interested in um, capturing uh, the light of the Orient. Yes, um, we'll now turn to uh, what we actually uh, did to all these uh, images, this collection of autochromes uh, and photochromes. Because as you remember from the research questions, what we want to know is can we actually distinguish between the two just by looking at the colors used? But more specifically, can we distinguish between the representation of the Orient and the Occident across these collections? And uh, these collections, as Thomas said, we harvested through the API and through the, through the actual website from the National Library of Congress and the Albert Kahn Museum. Um, uh, so we got all these images from all these different places of, uh, across the world, but of course places are uh, referred to in very different uh, uh, variations uh, depending on how uh, modern the names were. So we normalized those, we cropped the images, because some of these images had like additional information in the uh, sideline. We wanted to remove that, just focus on the images. 
Um, so we got uh, a lot of autochromes, a lot of photochromes. And we, we divided these two collections um, into two categories, so the Occident and the Orient, using domain knowledge. And what you see on the slide is here the division that we made. So uh, you can see how many images. Uh, so we got images from Belgium, an Occidental country, about uh, 1,100 in the autochrome, 137 in the photochrome. So we did this for a couple of countries, which uh, resulted in two collections of uh, Occident and Orient images in the autochrome collection and the same for the photochrome collection. So that is the data that we work with. Um, so what did we then do with this data? Uh, we applied machine learning techniques and also explainable AI techniques to investigate how these different media shape our ability to color in the world of others. So how did we use color to imagine these worlds? And then more specifically, how could color be used to imagine the Orient and the Occident in these two collections? So uh, I divide the, uh, the, the methods into two parts. First, the machine learning part and then the explainable AI part. Um, so as you saw, we have a lot of these images that are seen here. And we want to have a way to cluster these images. So, and we're interested in, in color and not so much in the objects on the image. So what we did is we extracted the dominant colors from these images using k-means clustering. So either eight or 16 colors. And we captures, captured how present this color was. So these bar charts basically show the dominant colors in the image and the, the, the width of the bar shows how present it is. Um, but as you can imagine, every single image has eight dominant colors. And even though these colors might be all kinds of blue, they can still change. So you end up for the total collection with still uh, many different dominant colors. So what we then did, similar to this transition from the color space to color terms, we uh, placed these dominant colors into buckets. So what we did is we divided the color space into buckets. So basically, you have a three-dimensional space, RGB values, and we divided this into equidistant spaces, ending up with, let's say, 216 buckets, 512 buckets. We used different sizes. And what we then did is we used these buckets and how prevalent they were in the collection. So the bucket on the left-hand side, for instance, uh, uh, on, the, on the bottom, how present was that? That was a feature we used in the uh, machine learning. So in the random forest classifier we used. So for every image, we have information on how present every bucket is in that image, and that is the information we use to classify. Is it a photochrome or an autochrome, or is it within the photochromes, orient or occident, et cetera? I will give the results in a bit. Um, well, we can do all kinds of machine learning stuff and a number rolls out and we can be very happy with that number. It can be high accuracy, low accuracy. Uh, but we also wanted to understand like, what is now actually going on. Uh, can, we, can we dive into how the machine learning algorithm works? And for this, we turn to something called Shapley Additive Explanations, which basically uses a game theoretic approach to uh, explore and explain the output of a machine learning model. So rather than just giving global feature importance score, so how important was this feature for the uh, overall uh, classification, this model can also give local interpretability, which means that you can, e uh, for every single feature, you can see for every single decision, so is this image uh, orient occident, you can show the importance of the feature, which gives you a lot to work with and to understand what was actually going on. I will give you an, an uh, image of the output, which makes it much clearer in a second. Uh, our findings. Um, so we have three principal findings that are related to the three research questions that Thomas just showed. Um, I will first briefly go through them and then dive into them uh, with a bit more detail. So what we found is that the classifier that I just described can actually distinguish very well between photochromes and autochromes. Um, and as you've seen, uh, these two also look quite different in the use of colors. So that wasn't too surprising, but still, using only uh, eight or 16 colors we, and then putting them in these buckets, we were quite surprised that the accuracy was this high. 0.95, the F score is also 0.95. Um, we also found that dominant colors are useful features to distinguish between representations of the Occident and Orient but only in the photochrome collection. So the classifier was able to distinguish between the two in this one collection, but not in the other collection. Uh, it was a bit better than chance, but uh, not very high. And using this SHAP, this explainable AI method, uh, we find that the presence, but also the absence of colors, 
Uh, as humanists, we're all often very much invested in what we find and what we do see, but it's, very, it's much more difficult to also take into account the things that are not there, which can also be important markers for something uh, being either in one or another category. Uh, so we found that the absence of colors is also a potent predictor of visual orientalism. Um, so as I said, we, we can distinguish between photochromes and autochromes based on the color. Um, and this shows that color sense, in, in a sense, became mediated. The use of the medium, so the photochrome and the autochrome, actually gave people the ability to use different colors to represent the world. Uh, so people were not entirely free to choose these colors. The medium dictated this as well. Um, um, and, we show, and we see that, that certain uh, presence and absence of colors are strong predictors. Um, so what we see here, so this is one of the outputs of this SHAP uh, uh, model is that feature 146, which is one of these buckets. Uh, on the top, you can see that is, this is one of the most important features in distinguishing between autochromes and photochromes, um, that if it's absence, so if it's blue, it's a very important predictor for it being an autochrome. When it's, when it's present, so it being red, it is an important predictor for it being a photochrome. But we see that there is a bit more ambivalence in the predicting whether it's a photochrome, and it's much more clear on the other end. Um, this is not the same for all the colors, but this gives you some uh, information on what do the colors actually do for the prediction. Um, conclusion two, can we differentiate between Orient and Occident across different color media? Um, yeah, as I said, for photochromes we can, for autochromes not. Um, so. As far as visual orientalism is concerned, the autochrome is, is in this sense a more objective medium. Uh, it shows the world as it is and it doesn't really give the maker the opportunity to, to imagine a world that is not in the real world there, but use your imagination to, to sort of use these visual phantasms, uh, these, these exaggerations of how the Orient might have looked. Um, so in that sense, the photochrome allows for more intervention by the printer, the person adding the colors. Um, and finally, the, uh, 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 the question, does the presence or absence of uh, specific colors define vis visual orientalism? Um, uh, we find that there are certain colors that are very potent predictors of visual orientalism. And uh, one color that we found uh, quite interesting was actually the color, uh, the bucket 18, which is quite green, but on this screen it's it's very dark green, but it's more of a light green color. Um, and it's actually a potent predictor of the Orient. And we actually expected it to be much more closely associated to the Occident. Uh, there's many pictures of, of forest areas and stuff. So this was also a quite unexpected result. Um, but we found that these actually, so again, the, the presence and the absence, as we also see on the, bottom, uh, on the top, they're very separated. So they're very potent predictors. Um, Finally, the discussion, um, we looked into the role that mediatization played in this, this, this historical color sense. Uh, of course, we've only looked at one transition going from the photochromes to the autochromes, but numerous other historical transitions exist. So this is something we want to explore in future work. Like can we uh, find this in other transitions as well? And one other thing that this uh, made us think about is that uh, we now, of course, have a lot of images that are also generated by AI models, and they also present users with, uh, with worlds that use very idiosyncratic color schemes of imagined worlds. And we were wondering what, what would this do with, uh, with people's perception of the world or future worlds if the colors that we are presented with are not there in the real world. Uh, so again, there's, there's this interaction between the medium and the affordances of the medium. Um, I guess that's about it. Uh, these are some of the works that we've used. Uh, there's code on GitHub and data on Zenodo, so the images that we used, and we are very happy to take uh, questions.